from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Steve Levingston, nonfiction editor of the Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. War is devastating in so many ways, often most devastating for the soldiers who survive it. Returning from war, soldiers sometimes suffer from depression, anxiety, and sleeplessness. It's been happening since the beginning of war and goes by a variety of names. In World War I, we, had, we heard about shell shock. World War II, soldiers came home suffering from combat fatigue. Vietnam vets and veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan suffer all too frequently from what we now call post-traumatic stress syndrome. How our nation handles these wounded warriors is the subject of Yochi Driesen's harrowing book, The Invisible Front. The book brings the issue into sharp focus through the experience of one family that endured the deaths of two soldiers, the brothers Jeff and Kevin Graham, one killed by a roadside bomb in Iraq, the other by suicide. As painful as death by an enemy combatant is, a death by suicide is deeply troubling, and for soldiers, the numbers are staggering. By 2002, more American soldiers were killing themselves than were dying in combat. Driesen's target in the book is the military's abysmal response to this mental health crisis. He tells the tale of Jeff and Kevin Graham and their family with courage, compassion, and humanity. As the New York Times said, this vital book is a stirring call to action to better aid American soldiers who struggle alone with depression. Driesen is the managing editor of Foreign Policy magazine. He has also covered the Iraq and Afghanistan wars for the Wall Street Journal. So please join me in welcoming Yochi Driesen. Hi, thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. They had warned me beforehand that this light was somewhat blinding, and it's correct. I think my corneas have now been sufficiently scorched. So if you see me squinting, you'll, you'll understand why. But again, thank you all for coming on this, uh, this sunny day. About six years ago, I flew out to Fort Carson in Colorado and drove onto the base and then drove on to the prettiest house on the base. And the base is the prettiest house in the US Army. This is a base that's ringed by the Rockies and is really, really magnificent. And the house that I went to was the house of Mark Graham. Mark Graham at that point was the general in command of Fort Carson. So he had, as you'd imagine, the nicest house. And I knocked at the door, and this very pert, very polite, very cheerful woman came out and put out her hand and said, hi, I'm Carol, welcome. And nothing about her would suggest anything other than a woman whose life had been full of laughter and full of joy. She, and she would use this phrase herself, so I, I don't mean it in any demeaning way, but she looked a little bit like a southern cheerleader sort of happy and kind of perky, the kind of person who would immediately want to make you feel at home. We'd never met, and she hugged me. That was her, her way of saying hello. And she looked at me and said, you remind me of my son, Kevin. And at the time, she couldn't have known how accurate that was in a lot of ways, and I couldn't have known the significance of that or, or why that would resonate for me years later. We began to talk, and she was telling me the story, as ultimately did Mark, of their two sons, of Kevin and Jeff, who, who Steve mentioned a moment ago. It's an amazing story, and it's kind of a sad one that ultimately ends in a very different place than it starts. But for me, it started at that house. It started walking into a house full of pictures of a family that once existed and didn't anymore. Framed pictures of the two boys, of the two boys and their sister, of this family who are beautiful, beautiful. The dad looks like what you'd imagine a general from central casting to look like, sort of tall and kind of ramrod straight, a little cleft in the chin and these two athletic boys and their sister was a swimmer. Just a beautiful family. Carol would later refer to the family as a Walt Disney family and as a kind of Norman Rockwell family, and that was accurate. I'd flown out in 2009 to see them for two reasons. One was to hear their story, and two was to try to figure out how their story impacted what the US military as a whole was going through at the time. I'd lived in Iraq for three years, and I'd spent another year shuttling back and forth from there to the States, and then ultimately from there to Afghanistan, and had an enormous amount of military friends. You know, you'd go and you'd see the same guys basically over and over again, and when I was younger and had less gray hair, they'd be much younger soldiers, and I'd see them again, and I'd have more gray hair, and they'd be slightly more seasoned soldiers, but it'd be the same people. And when they came home, we'd talk by Facebook or over email. We'd see each other whenever we were in the same place. And they began to tell me 
first kind of grudgingly and then openly. But over time, it took a while for them to be even willing to say it grudgingly. But they began to talk about how they felt they had changed, how they came home and their wives didn't recognize them. And they would look at their kids, and their kids would occasionally look at them with fear in their eyes. And they'd have trouble sleeping, and they'd have flashes of anger. Little things would set them off. They'd go to a restaurant and have a table they didn't like, and they'd want to punch the waiter. They'd be playing basketball, and someone would bump them, and they'd want to punch the person who bumped them. And they couldn't sleep, and they'd have vivid dreams during the day. At night, if they heard a sound, they'd wake up and not be able to fall back asleep. And they would talk about how they would look in the mirror, and they wouldn't recognize the person staring back either, that they would see a person who was disfigured, even if they had no physical wound, and who had been changed by war, even if they came back physically intact. And some of them would tell me that they were drinking, and some would tell me that they were taking drugs, and some would tell me that they were depressed. Some would say they were thinking of committing suicide, and a couple did. To me, this was devastating. Setting aside being a journalist, this was devastating on a personal level. Some of these guys were friends. And these are people who had served one, two, three, four times, come back without a scratch, for the most part, come back alive and safe. And when they came back here, they carried with them something, and that thing ultimately took their life. And the idea of that, the idea of surviving a war, and then to come back and die from that war all the same, was heartbreaking. And on a personal level, for reasons I'll get to in a moment, it also hit at something that I was carrying too that at the time I didn't realize the degree to which I was carrying it or just how deep down it was being carried. But I'll, but I'll come back to that in a little bit. 2009, the year that I went to go see Mark and Carol Graham, was a pivotal year for the military. The military suicide rate had been rising every year since the Afghan war started, kind of like this. But for years, when the military would be asked, you guys have an epidemic of suicide, what are you doing about it? They would say something that was both accurate and kind of irrelevant. They would say, we have a problem. But the civilian problem is worse. And that was true. Even as the military rate got higher and higher and higher, if you compared the demographics of the military, which is predominantly male, mostly 18 to about 25, to the same demographic in the civilian world, the military rate was actually lower. So they were both rising, almost in parallel. But the military rate was for a long time lower than the civilian rate. 2009 changed. 2009 was the first year where those lines intersected. And after 2009, the military rate kept rising and rising and rising. And at a point, they could no longer deny that they, what they were facing. It was an epidemic of people who had come back with PTSD, with other invisible wounds, and an epidemic of people who were taking their own life. And again, for me, this was personal. And when I, when I was at the Pentagon as a reporter, I'd walk the halls every now and then, and I would ask people, do you guys have friends? Do you guys, have you served with people for whom this is an issue? And almost everyone would say that it was true, that they did. And I would ask, do you know of anybody who's doing something interesting on this, who's trying to change the way the military is operating? And they would say, Mark Graham. And I would just hear that name again, Mark Graham, Mark Graham, Mark Graham. And I was told that this was a general, and he had lost two sons, as Steve indicated, one who was killed in Iraq and one who killed himself. And when I heard that, I was sort of floored. First, generals, it's rare to meet one who has lost a son, full stop. But secondly, the idea of losing two children ignoring whether you wear a uniform or don't, but the idea of losing two children and still being functional was just stunning to me. It, it floored me. And at first I thought, that can't actually possibly be true. And maybe this guy lost a son and is worth talking to, but it can't be that he lost both. But it was true. It was true. And I began to look into what he was doing at Fort Carson. Fort Carson, when he got there, had one of the highest suicide rates in the military. He changed it. And by the time he left, he had one of the lowest. I'll talk to that in a second about what he did. But I wanted to meet this man, and I wanted to meet Carol. I wanted to see what kind of people could go through that kind of tragedy, still get out of bed in the morning, still just make their way through a normal day, but also try to find a purpose in it, also try to find something they could take from the tragedy to try to help others, which is what they did, and I'll talk to that in a moment too. Mark and Carol became family to me in the course of writing this book. We spent probably 100 hours talking and I would ask them to relive these painful moments again and again, and they would. And sometimes we would joke together, sometimes we would cry together, sometimes we'd go see a movie together. My wife and I just had a baby boy, and the first phone call beyond the ones to our parents and to my wife's sister was to them. I mean, they've become family to me. They are loving and they are extraordinary. And when we were writing the book, Carol said to me more than once that she worried that people would read the book or hear their story and think that they had failed as parents that 
If they had paid more attention to Kevin, their son who killed himself, they could have stopped it. Or if they had interceded with Jeff who wanted to go serve in Iraq and didn't have to, incidentally, and they could have kept him from going and he'd also be alive. And they felt people are going to look at this book and think we're the two worst parents in the world. I hope that as you listen to their story and if you read the book, that you come to a very different conclusion. To my mind, the word hero is often overused. The, the term heroism is overused. But to go through the, what they went through and to find a way to share it in the hope that someone else is helped by the, their sharing of it, that to me is heroism. So I'd like to read you a little bit about Jeff and Kevin. Jeff was the older of the two brothers. Jeff was shorter but kind of radiated confidence. He was the one who, in high school and college, was the one girls gravitated to. He was a bit of a drinker as he got older. He was always the more outgoing of the two. He was the one who looked, in terms of his face, exactly like his dad and wanted to do exactly what his dad did. He wanted to be, in the, he wanted to be a soldier. He wanted to lead other soldiers into combat. And that's all he ever wanted to do. From the time he was a little kid, he had little camouflage pajamas. He would do little like mock raids in the neighborhood. But it's all he wanted was to be a soldier. Kevin, his brother, was taller, was a bit heavier. And Kevin was a gentler soul. He didn't want to be a soldier in the same way. He wanted to be a doctor. He was the kind of kid that we learned about the Holocaust while he was living in a base in Germany. He couldn't get past it. For days, he kept saying to his mom, Mom, how could people do that? How could people do that? We heard about the deaths of the Native Americans here. Same thing. He was a very sensitive, gentle soul. And they were very different. They looked different. One was big, one was short, one was thin, one was fat. They had different sensitive humor. But they were exceptionally close. And I'd like to just read you for a moment a scene that describes the kind of closeness they have and the kind of relationship they had. Even as a child, Jeff Graham was analytical, self-assured, and mischievous, traits that would grow stronger with time. When he was a toddler, Carol decided to teach him the importance of waking up early enough to make his own bed, something he had absolutely no desire to do. Instead, Jeff would finish his nightly bath, put on the clothes he planned to wear the following day, and then go to sleep in his Star Wars sleeping bag, leaving the sheets and pillows untouched. Next morning, he'd jump out of bed already dressed, zip up the sleeping bag, be ready for school. And that bought him an extra hour every day. He could also be stubborn. At breakfast, he insists on only eating Cheerios, and only if he could pour the milk himself. When Carol would complain they never listened, he would grin and say, Mom, I always listen, but then I make up my own mind. Kevin was born in November of 1981 at Fort Sill in Oklahoma the first place Mark served after Germany. Carol wanted to surprise her sisters, and Hannah told them that she was even pregnant with Kevin. And when he came, he was sort of the perfect son. He was late, like Jeff. So Carol drank castor oil. She would walk steps. She would jump up and down to try to get him to, to come, and, and he wouldn't. But from the start, from the time he was born, he was the one who would listen. So whenever Carol would make breakfast, he would eat whatever she made. Whatever cereal she put on the table, he would happily eat. Whenever there was talk of going out for ice cream, Jeff would say, me first, me first. Kevin would say, me last, me last. He was a gentle child, eager to please both his parents and his grandparents. When he was three, he had a small handmade blanket, and he would suck his thumb as he fell asleep each night. During a family visit to Kentucky, his grandfather Carl told him, big boys don't suck their thumbs, and promised to give him a big boy trophy if he dropped the habit. Kevin told Carol they wanted his grandfather to be proud of him, but needed one more night to hold on to the blanket. Next morning, she was making pancakes when he marched into the kitchen, climbed onto a chair, and handed her the neatly folded blanket. He never held on to the Afghan or sucked his thumb again. True to his word, Carl shipped Kevin a trophy that the young boy immediately and proudly put on his dresser. Jeff, for his part, thought the whole thing was ridiculous. He slept with a stuffed raccoon and sucked his thumb until he was six years old. When he made up his mind about something, Jeff Graham didn't care what other people thought. This family was exceptionally close. They were a military family, which meant that they were moving from base to base inside the US to Germany to Korea. And as many military families do, the siblings became their best friends, because whenever they'd have one group of friends, they'd move. And whenever they'd have a new group of friends, they'd move again. So they were each other's best friends, Kevin and Jeff and their baby sister, Melanie, who, who was the youngest of the three. And wherever they'd go, they would begin to talk about the future. And again, for Jeff, it was always about the army. Always. For Kevin, it was about medical school, maybe going to get a degree in philosophy. It was never the same. As he got older, he began to gravitate, like his brother, towards ROTC, 
but his friends would later think that he was trying to set aside his own dreams to live as parents, that he was doing what he assumed they wanted him to do, not what he knew he wanted himself to do. Years later, incidentally, that's one of the things that Mark and Carol would be most haunted by, this feeling that if they had hinted differently or acted differently, maybe he wouldn't have joined the military at all. So Mark's career kept going. He served in Kuwait during the first Gulf War. He served in Germany. He moved from major to lieutenant colonel, lieutenant colonel to colonel, up to general. And the family would move with him. And by the time they were back in the States, just as Mark was about to be promoted to be a one-star general, both Jeff and Kevin were at the University of Kentucky, both of them doing ROTC. Kevin had always been the one whose grades were the better of the two. He'd always been the one who really focused more on school. Jeff was the party boy. Jeff was the one who would go drinking. Jeff was the one who, in Mardi Gras, would bring University of Kentucky stuff and hang it everywhere. During the NCAA tournament, he would take a black marker and write the full bracket on a wall of his house, which his landlord, as you might imagine, didn't like. But Kevin was the gentle soul. And what his family didn't realize until much too late was that he was wearing a mask and that the Kevin that they saw wasn't actually the Kevin that Kevin felt himself to be. And his grades began to suffer. He began to drink. He was diagnosed with depression and put on Prozac. Now, at the time this was happening, Jeff, who was a year older, was about to be commissioned into the Army. It was a moment of true happiness for the family. Kevin felt correctly that if the military running the ROTC program found out he was on Prozac, that he'd be kicked out. And he was right, by the way, to fear that. And he thought, my career is going to end before it starts. I'm going to embarrass my family. I'm going to embarrass my brother. And so he stopped taking it. And for anybody who's taking medication, if you take it off cold turkey, if you're in a spiral, you start spiraling down faster. Whatever bad place you were in, you go back to that place, and then you find an even worse place. And that's what happened with Kevin. He didn't tell anybody he had taken Prozac in the first place because he was embarrassed. He didn't tell anybody he stopped taking it. And the mask was still there. People didn't see it. But he was changing. And again, that spiral was spiraling down faster and faster and faster. After his suicide, his siblings found a little to-do list in his dorm room at the University of Kentucky. To give you a sense of how close they were, the three siblings lived together, which kind of blows my mind. The idea of having my sister next door to me in college would be incomprehensible. But it was a little to-do list. And the first few things were kind of banal, pick up laundry, buy new books, buy new notepads. And then the last one was take toaster into the bathtub. But they didn't find this out until, until it was much, much, much too late. Jeff and Kevin, the thing they would always do, their, their hobby was golf. Kevin was a little bit fat. Jeff was a little bit short. They figured playing golf, it didn't matter. That was the one place where neither height nor fatness impacted them at all. Jeff was commissioned. He was getting ready to leave for advanced training and ultimately perhaps to Iraq. And they made plans to play golf. One last time before Jeff left. And Jeff went to the golf course and waited. And Kevin didn't show up. And he called his cell phone. No answer. Called the home phone. It was 2003, so there were still home phones. No answer. He called Melanie, their sister, and said, can you find out where Kevin is? He, he was supposed to be here an hour ago. He hasn't showed up. Melanie walked to Kevin's door, and she knocked once, and there was no answer. She knocked a second time, and there was no answer. She knocked a third time. She turned the knob, and her brother was hanging from a fan. And for a second, for one second, and she would remember this years later, she thought it was a prank. It was just some weird, sick prank, because they would do that kind of stuff to, them, to her sister, their sister all the time. They thought, mm, maybe this isn't real. But that lasted a second. And then she immediately realized after that that it was real, that this nightmare was happening in front of her. And Kevin had killed himself. Now, for the family, it was a religious family, a religious Christian family. And members of the family said to Mark and Carol, no Christian burial. He took his own life. He's a sin. He doesn't deserve to be a, given a church service or buried in a Christian cemetery. To Mark and Carol, they felt this is insulting and absurd. Their son died. They loved their son. They would give their son the funeral he deserved. But part of it would, would haunt them later, and I'll come to that in a moment, the way that Kevin was treated, the way that his death was treated. Kevin dies. Jeff, at this point, is getting ready to go. He has the choice of whether to continue serving or to stop continue serving, to, to leave the military. Mark has the same choice. Mark, by this point, had served his 20 years. He could retire, and he wanted to. He thought, how can I possibly wear this uniform if my son was training to put on this uniform, and that may have been what stressed him out to the point he took his own life? How could I possibly wear this uniform? And he was getting ready to retire. He has paperwork drawn up. 
Carol one morning saw him and said to him, this can either be a chapter in the book of our lives or this can be the whole book. A phrase that, that really has stuck with me ever since. And so Mark decided to stay in. Now Jeff had a decision to make too. The decision Jeff had to make was, should he go to Iraq? He didn't need to. Mark had friends throughout the military. He could have made one call, pulled one string, and Jeff wouldn't have, wouldn't have gone. And Mark and Carol agonized about whether they should try to do that. But then they felt that that would be unfair to Jeff. Jeff had spent his whole life training for this. It's all he wanted to do. And to stand in the way of it, they felt it would be dashing his dream. It would be unfair. And so they didn't make that call, and they didn't pull that string. And so Jeff deployed to Iraq. He deployed to Fallujah. The place he deployed to, the specific place, was a place I was in um, at almost the same time. I didn't know Jeff, obviously, at the time. But later, when I was trying to recreate what happened to him, I could visualize it because I'd been there. Jeff showed up at a unit that had lost its previous lieutenant. They were in one of the bloodiest parts of Iraq then and now, for anybody obviously who's following the news of the Islamic State taking Fallujah. Fallujah has been soaked by blood for more than a decade now. And while they were there, it was one of the bloodiest periods of the whole war. But it was where Jeff wanted to be. He wanted to be in that place. He wanted to be doing what his men were doing. When he showed up, they called him the Oompa Loompa, because he was about 5'6". Most officers would not take kindly to being called an Oompa Loompa, Jeff thought it was hysterically funny. He had no problem with it. That was the way he bonded with his guys. He had a sense of humor, and he didn't take himself too seriously. One day, they were given a mission that everyone in the unit was a little bit worried about. They had trained to go in heavy armor. They hadn't been trained as infantry guys. They hadn't been trained to walk foot patrols. But they had been converted into that kind of unit because the military needed guys who could be infantry. And so suddenly, poof, a unit that was trained to not be infantry, you're infantry and they would be walking foot patrols in and around Fallujah every day. For safety, they would try to vary the route. They would try to go different times of day. They would try to not be carrying on any kind of routine for fear that insurgents would see that routine and then have a way of attacking them, no when and, and no how. But this day, they were told to take the same route they'd taken before and to do it during the day. And the whole unit, there was like a sense of foreboding. There was a sense that something was wrong. Jeff wasn't supposed to go that day. He was supposed to stay back. One of the things that Mark and Carol gave me for the book, for the research of it, was Jeff's diary. Jeff's fiance didn't know it existed. It was a difficult thing for them to share because all of his hopes, all of his dreams were in this one book. Every page of the diary, every day, the last entry would be something to his brother. It would be, Kevin, help me get my guys home safely. Kevin, I miss you. But literally every page. And for me, writing the book, it was invaluable because I could recreate sort of how he was feeling at a given time, where he was, what he was doing. The day that I'm talking about was supposed to be a kind of routine day. The mission itself would be routine. And in his diary, he describes it as routine, and he cuts it off mid-page and says, I'll pick this up when I get back. And to me, visually, that was always very moving, to see this page just stop. So now we're back in Fallujah. And Jess leading his men on patrol. He always, when he was out with these guys, led them from the front. And they got to a bridge. They had to get to the other side of the bridge, and he sent out two guys ahead of them. And the two guys saw something on one of the guardrails, but it didn't look all that suspicious, and they kind of brushed the sand off. It looked just like a piece of metal, so they, they kept going. And then it was Jeff's turn. It was him, a radio man named Roger Ling, and an Iraqi policeman. It was the three of them. And the unit was right behind them, maybe 20 feet, 20 feet, 25 feet. And so Jeff, as he was walking, saw something, that same glimmer. And for him, something else, a synapse fired. He, he saw it differently. And he turned to tell the guys behind him, stay back. And as he turned, it detonated. And what the other guys had missed and what he saw was a buried bomb, an IED. The other soldier, Roger Ling, who was 22, he was killed immediately. The Iraqi policeman was killed immediately. Jeff lingered on for a very short time, but, but also, also died. And when Mark and Carol were told this, they were later told that in Jeff's pocket was Kevin's driver's license. They had taken it with him to Iraq. And they took a little bit of comfort that their, their boys, their brothers, had lived together, and ultimately at that last moment they'd been together again. Now, the military has a very sophisticated and very elaborate system for telling families about a death. Because what they don't want to have something happen is for a family to find out by rumor. They have to have the people, we've all seen the movies, of the guys in uniform show up at the door. That's the way it's supposed to be. Mark, because he was in the military, at, at this point he was high-ranking in the military, found out through the grapevine. But he couldn't tell Carol. And so the hardest part of Mark's life was this stretch of about six hours where he knew and Carol didn't. And he had to figure out, ultimately, how could he tell her? How would he tell her their other son was gone? And he ultimately did. 
devastated both of them. To use the word devastated understates it. Carol thought about suicide. She thought, I don't deserve to live. I failed my sons. She thought about it, but didn't do it, didn't carry it out. And Mark again thought, I can't serve. I can't. Now it's taken my second son. I'm, I'm out. Then he got word he was being promoted up, and he wavered a little bit. And again, Carol said, no, you should, you should stay. You should stay. Again, this should be a chapter. This shouldn't be the whole book. Mark became a two-star general. And the command he was given was Fort Carson. Fort Carson, again, is one of the most physically beautiful bases in the entire military. It's really stunning. But when Mark got there, there was this cancer within the base that he didn't know was there. There was a cancer of murder. There was a unit whose unit nickname was the Lethal Warriors, which was ultimately a terribly ironic name because this unit came back and started killing people. It killed people in Fort Carson who were civilian, killed other troops. The military had not ever seen anything quite like it. One unit killed this many people. And Fort Carson had a suicide rate that was astronomically high. And Fort Carson had something called stigma, which is a phrase that's clinical and cold, but I want to talk to you for a moment. It had a culture of stigma, where people who thought they needed help or wanted to go get help were made to feel like they were cowards. They were made to feel weak. They were pushed out of the unit if they could be either in a physical sense, sort of made to stand separately, or in a literal sense, actually kicked out of the military altogether. And stigma is a it's sort of clinical term. And what it manifests as is not clinical at all. It's very human. So here are two examples of what stigma was like at Fort Carson. A soldier tried to kill himself and scrawled using black marker a suicide note on the barracks room that he was living in. He survived. Thankfully, he was given help and survived. But they arrested him, and they were going to charge him for defacing government property. So his mom drove up and said, if I paint it, if I repaint it, will you leave my son out? You know, he's troubled. He, he can't deal with this can I repaint it? And they said, yeah, you can repaint it. So a mother of a suicidal soldier spent a Saturday repainting the wall, and they charged him anyway. There was a soldier who was troubled and a bit of a drinker, and the sergeant in his unit said, kill yourself already and save me the paperwork. That's the kind of place Mark went to. It was the kind of place where a unit that was getting ready to deploy had a sign-out sheet next to where you'd sign out to go see a doctor. They had a fake sign-out sheet if you were going to go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Forget the language for a second. But it had, I'm going to see a therapist for, and it was choices. One, I'm a coward. Two, I'm a pussy. Three, I'm a weak bitch. Four, all of the above. So again, forget the language, but that's the kind of thing that people were facing. People who wanted to get help were being made to feel like they were the weakest of the weak, that they didn't belong in the US Army, that they should be drummed out. And this is where Mark found himself. Mark, who had lost two sons, this is where he found himself in command. What he did, with Carol's help, was begin to talk openly about his two sons. And he would cry every time he did. For people who, in this audience, may have friends in the military, may have served, you don't usually see generals cry. And it's kind of jarring. And a lot of people at the base thought, this guy is soft. This is the guy who's leading us to war. This guy who's up there crying. But he did a, it, there was a point to it. And he was trying to tell people it was OK, that to show emotion was OK, to feel emotion was OK. And then in his case, he had gone through this tragedy, but it hadn't broken him. And that if they sought help, it wouldn't break them either. That was the first way he tried to change the culture. The second way, and this is something that ultimately would be replicated across the army, was he turned Fort Carson into a lab, where basically, if anybody had an idea that seemed remotely promising, his thought was, well, if it's not going to do any harm, let's use it. Let's try it. So one guy said, how about we do yoga for the troops? And it was kind of mocked, but Mark said, sure, let's do yoga for the troops, and it became hugely popular. It's called Joga, you know, Joe, like G.I. Joe. But it's now offered to pretty much every base in the country, and when you go, it's kind of surreal to see guys with shaved heads, you know, shorter than this, doing downward dog, but it's, it's done. <laughs> you know, deep breathing, meditation, also done. But the bigger things were systemic. The bigger things were trying to figure out how do you make it such that a person who wants to get help and who needs to get help can feel safe in getting help that they can feel like they won't be kicked out and they won't be mocked. And so Mark did a couple of things. One of them, the part that would be replicated ultimately the most widely, and I think saved the most lives, was to create, I won't give you the military acronym because it's horrible, like all military acronyms, but the idea of it was called an embedded behavioral health team. Again, like most military phrases, kind of overly complicated. The idea was you would take a specific therapist, or two, or three, and you would assign them to a unit so that the guys in that unit, the women in that unit, they knew that person before they deployed. They knew them while they deployed. They knew them when they came back. So that the person 
that they had a relationship with wasn't a stranger. They felt comfortable talking to the therapist. The therapist could tell something was off with them. That was ultimately replicated across the entire US military. Almost every brigade now has something like that. He also was willing to go to bat for individual soldiers, soldiers who had been, in one case, drummed out because his commander didn't believe he had PTSD. Mark did the very rare thing of reaching down from above and pulling that soldier back in, overruling the colonel who had kicked him out. This was not popular. It's not popular for a colonel who feels like, this is my unit, these are my guys, to have a general come in and say, eh, wrong, and overturn it. But Mark did that because he felt it was important. That's become the mission of their lives. Mark and Carol spent the end of their military career at Fort Carson. By the time they left, it had one of the lowest suicide rates in the country. I wish that that was the happy ending of Fort Carson. It's not. Some of the stuff they did was undone by the next commander, and the rate went back up a little bit. Mark retired. He didn't get his third star. If you ask him, he'll say it has nothing to do with how open he was about talking about suicide or criticizing the military. I spent some years with him now, and I'm firmly convinced that that's why he didn't get his third star. If he had been sort of quieter and not called attention to the stuff he did call attention to, he'd have been promoted up. When he retired, he had the option many generals have of cash out, go join a corporate board, join a company, make a lot of money, and he didn't. And instead, moved to New Jersey, set up a veteran support program called Vets for Warriors, and that's what he spends his life doing, is setting up ways for veterans to speak to veterans, feeling that somebody who served is most comfortable talking to someone else who served. And Carol travels the country, and she tells her story again and again. And I've known them now for six years, and I've, I've been there and listened to them talk. The, the word closure, to my mind, is insulting. It's kind of revolting, the idea that you could suffer this loss, and somehow, at some later date, it's gone. And every time they tell the story, they cry, every time. It hasn't faded, and it won't ever fade, and it shouldn't fade. This, to them, is what keeps them going, the sort of belief that maybe if they speak to a room of 100 people, one person in that room who might not have got help, who might have thought of themselves as weak because they thought they needed help, would hear their story and decide, no, it's OK. I'm going to go do that. I'm going to seek help. My life may change. To them, that's worth the, the pain of reliving things. I'd like to, before we take questions, close with a little bit about Mark, a little bit about what they're doing today. Mark is part of, works with an organization called Give an Hour, which is a wonderful organization, incidentally. It is a network of therapists across the country, civilians who volunteer to donate an hour a week pro bono for veterans or families who need help. On a rainy day in the summer of 2013, Mark Graham sat down behind a table in a windowless auditorium at Columbia University for a panel discussion on the military suicide rate, which be began to attract widespread media and congressional attention. More than 120 soldiers had killed themselves in the first five months of the year, and military officials knew 2013 would set another grim record. Mark had flown there to spend the day with a room full of mental health professionals who might one day confront the kind of demons that had claimed his son. We learned about the impact of mental health in the worst way possible, he said, choking up. We truly wish we knew then what we know now. We truly wish we had known that we were part of the stigma, that we didn't hear what our son was trying to tell us, but nothing we do will ever bring him back. Mark continued with the story of one of Jeff's last nights in the United States. Shortly before deploying to Iraq, a young soldier knocked on Jeff's door and quietly asked if he was the soldier who lost a brother to suicide. The soldier told Jeff his father had killed himself, and he was, the saving, he was having the same dark thoughts, but didn't want to tell anyone in his unit for fear of being kicked out. Jeff told him to get help immediately. Nothing, he said, was more important than that soldier's life. And there'd be other ways of serving the country if he did have to leave the military. In the fall of 2003, with US troops already fighting and dying in Iraq, Jeff called Mark and said he wouldn't have known what to say that night if his brother hadn't committed suicide. Kevin's death, he told his father, had given him the knowledge to help save that other young soldier's life. That's one reason my wife and I do what I do, Mark concluded. Before he died, Jeff told us to promise that we wouldn't stop doing what we're doing. He told us there were too many other Kevins out there. So here we are. We won't stop. Thank you very much. I think we have time for questions, and I think there are microphones set up on both sides. Thanks very much. I was very fortunate to receive your book as a gift and was 
riveted by it. Thank you. Um, and I have to say, after I finished it, um, I actually felt a little bit helpless. And I felt like the situation was a little bit helpless because despite all of what this family has done, there are still so many stigmas and obstacles in their way. I'm wondering, in your own reflection on what you've heard and listened, what do you see, what causes you to be optimistic, I guess? First of all, I mean, thank you. It's a hard thing sometimes to find, frankly, optimism, because on this issue, there is no silver bullet. And Nick used that phrase before about silver buckshot. The military is like a giant ship. And when it turns, it takes a while. But then once it turns, it steams all full speed ahead. So the amount of money being spent now by the military on research into suicide, into depression, into PTSD is staggering. And they're beginning to find things that will be helpful, not just in the military, but in the civilian world too. So one reason for optimism is that the money is there. The money, depression is not a sexy topic. Neither is suicide. But because the military is spending money, there's resources that were never there before. A quick side note, the scariest statistic I found in researching this book was that since the creation of the car, auto accidents killed more people than anything else other than illness and, and gun violence. In 2012, that changed. 2012, suicide killed more people than car crashes. And since then, those numbers have again, car crashes like this, suicide like that. So just bear in mind, if you're watching local news or you're seeing the paper, there's a car crash and it's a, it's a horrible tragedy and some number of people died, that same day more people killed themselves. So it, it's an issue for the whole country. It's not an issue just for the military. We like to think sometimes the military is different and distinct, but we're the military and the military is us. The one reflects the other. And so the problem that faces the one faces the other, but the fact that there's more resources now than before is a good thing, not just the military, but for the civilian world. One last thing, because um, it was a very, very good question. There are groups like Given Hour, which I mentioned, which are wonderful organizations. They, money that goes to them goes straight to, or, to organizational work. It doesn't go to salaries. They do great work. There's an organization called TAPS, which supports the families of soldiers who have died. Again, does great work. But the best thing, I think, and it's a simple one, is if you see someone who served, don't just say thank you for your service and walk off and kind of feel good about yourself that, hey, I thank them and now I've done my work for the day. But actually ask them how their day was, just to actually try to talk and engage. The military is so separate from us right now. I mean, people in this room may know someone who served, but you know, walking the streets of Washington, Chicago, where I'm from, New York, probably no one you see will have served. Probably no one you see will have known someone who served. And so even just doing that question of asking, how are you? Where are you from? Just the basic conversation to a lot of guys, they don't have a chance to express it, and it goes a long way. Thank you. I came in a little bit later, so I apologize if I'm asking something you've already answered. The therapists that you mentioned who are, uh, I guess, embedded with the deployments, who looks after the therapists? Uh, and that's, that's maybe a small question. The second question I have is, um, is there any evidence that you found that the attention to mental health issue in the military is um, helping, helped uh, add mental health services to the Affordable Care Act? Uh, that was a fairly significant uh, uh, part of that act. I'm just wondering, did that help the military or the military help that, or is there no relationship whatsoever between those? So to take the, the first question first, and which is a great one, unfortunately, no one, really. The military doesn't have enough resources, frankly, to look after the soldiers that are, and Marines and airmen, whatever service, that are the first people going to the therapist themselves. So there's definitely not enough therapists, unfortunately, to look after the other therapists who are trying to help you know, that, that large wave of people. Frankly, the way the military deals with a lot of issues it's dealing with now is through medication. And it's a terrifying, terrifying problem. I was embedded once in a base in eastern Afghanistan that was the military's brilliance at the time. It was at the foot of a mountain and the Taliban had control at the top. And they would just shell it day by day by day. It was literally like World War I. You'd put on, you know, your armor and you'd sort of go between sandbags, try to get from place to place. While I was there, there was a guy from the public health service who was doing basically a survey of how many people there were on prescription medication. There are 50 guys there, all 50. And when he asked them what they were taking, they were taking Xanax, Ambien, pretty much any kind of sleep medication or antidepressant. And they were taking them in dosages that were just insane. You know, so Xanax, you're supposed to take three, maybe four a day, they would take nine. You know, Ambien, one or two a day, they would take five. And so these guys, there's just no control over it. They would trade drugs that one guy had a prescription, the other guy didn't, so they'd swap. And then they'd come back. And one of two things would happen. They'd have to go cold turkey because they didn't have a prescription in the first place, which is very dangerous. Or they'd have to wind down to what actual people take, also very dangerous. 
But that's the way the military now is still, is dealing with a lot of this. It's medicate, medicate, medicate. And for some of the therapists too, some of the therapists themselves are also taking medication. Yes, hi. Um, I was just wondering, you, you told us about these, you know, these horrible deaths and, and how the parents are dealing with it. What happened to Melanie? She lost her brothers. Um, she was so close to them. I'm really glad you asked. Um, thank you for asking. I should have mentioned that before, and I'm really glad that you bring it up. Uh, Melanie is an amazing woman. Melanie lives in New York. Um, her husband, Joe, was a Special Forces veteran. He had worked for Mark and met Melanie because he was working for Mark. So having the balls to ask out your boss's daughter when your boss is a general, this is a, it's a brave man. Fortunately, it worked. If it didn't, Jeff would be, uh, sorry, uh, Joe would be deployed somewhere horrible doing very, very boring work. Um, Joe had lost his brother on 9-11, and so he himself is, is no, no stranger, unfortunately, to tragedy. And they built a beautiful marriage. And my wife and I are very close with them, actually. We had dinner with them two nights ago. They occasionally talk about how they feel guilty sometimes because they laugh and they have joy in their lives and there are times where they feel bad that they do, but they do. And when you, you meet them, you would never in a million years guess what either of them had gone through. Melanie's a nurse in New York City in Manhattan. She's fashionable, she's really funny. Joe is a kind of Irish Catholic who could, if you were here, the whole room would be laughing uproariously. And you would never guess either of them had lost someone and they built a beautiful life. Yeah, these are very moving stories and very disturbing. And I think indicative of much bigger problems in our society. The military draws from our broader society and um, in the news today is this pillow fight at, at West, West Point, Point yeah, I saw that. and how that relates to how the military is run. These are our future leaders in the military. Yeah, I mean, what she's referencing is a, a pillow fight at West Point that was once a pillow fight. This year, guys put helmets into the pillows, and so you had like two dozen people go to the hospital, one guy had a broken leg. Um, but the first point I agree with completely. You know, we have a luxury, many of us who live in big cities or who didn't feel the need to serve, may not have come from military families, of being able to think of the military as this other object. And, and to a degree it is. It has its own language. It speaks different acronyms. It, people come and know how to spend their day. They wear the same thing. So to a degree it is its own world, but it's also us. And when we try to think of suicide as a military suicide problem, if we put that first word before the second, we do a disservice because it's a suicide problem for our country. So I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, hey, Michael. How are you? I was just wondering, the statistic you used about uh, suicide surpassing um, car deaths, you could say the same thing. You could say also gun wounds are surpassing uh, car deaths. And I was wondering, in addition to mental health, if uh, the military is looking at access to guns. I know Israel's done some stuff with guns, uh, and there's been some studies on that, and I didn't know. They are. There's a thing called means restriction. The idea is that you might be suicidal for quite some time, but then there's one moment that happens where you decide, now I'm going to do it. And that if you can keep that person from in that moment acting on it, you might save the life. So the notion is, let's say you put a trigger guard on the handgun. So the guy, he wants to kill himself. The moment's arrived, he picks up the gun, but then he can't actually pull the trigger. And he has to find a key, and maybe in that moment to, that, that takes him to find the key, the impulse passes. The military has experimented with trying to make it harder for guys to have guns at home. The NRA has blocked it. There was for a while the NRA managed to sneak a provision into a military authorization bill that literally made it illegal for a commanding officer to ask his guys if they had guns at home. It was illegal. That was stripped away, but they had snuck it in. But short answer is yes, there is an attempt to do that for the reason that if you build in that one extra minute, maybe you could save the life. I think we're running out of time, but I think we have one question. Um, you've spoken about the Grams and their pain and Melanie, and uh, you also spoke about being in Iraq and being embedded. What about you? How does it affect you? I mean, I know you're a reporter, but you're also a person. How do you deal with the depression and the sadness that just comes from your job? When, when I came back, it took me years to accept that I had PTSD too. And I thought of myself that I was the kind of journalist who went to war zones, so I was a tough guy. And if I came back and I was feeling sad, I could just think my way through it. But I couldn't. Ultimately, in researching the book, I spoke the language they did because I had gone through the same things they did. So the PTSD they felt, I felt too. It made it simultaneously more painful, but also a bit easier because 
I knew what they were, where these guys were coming from, and I knew how to talk to them in a language they would understand. But anybody who goes comes back different. Journalist, aid worker, diplomat, soldier. That's one thing, as a country, we should remember next time there's a war. Everyone who goes and is touched by it comes back different than when they left, without exception. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.